Hello and welcome back to Class Time, Cape Chemistry. I'm Ricardo Price. The topic for today is forces of attraction. Let's get into it. So, as you know, today's topic is forces of attraction and we're doing Cape Unit 1, Chemistry. But before we get into today's lesson, let's look at a set of objectives set out in the Cape syllabus. The first one says, that we should state the various forces of attraction. And these are ionic, covalent, hydrogen bonding, metallic bonding, and the van der Waals forces of attraction. The second says we should state the relationship between forces of attraction and the states of matter. So what about these forces of attraction? The what about the strength of the forces of attraction that allows matter to exist in the various states? We should also relate the physical properties of matter to the to differences in strengths of the various forces of attraction. Physical properties include melting point, boiling point, and solubilities. Now, let's look at the various states of matter. Now, the main states of matter is solid, liquid, and gas. There is a fourth called plasma, but at this level you don't need to know about that right now. Solids have a fixed shape, as you can see, and a fixed volume. This is because the particles are held in place by very strong intermolecular forces, and we'll touch on that a bit further. It has a fixed volume, meaning if you put it in a different container, it will not take the shape of the container. Unlike liquids, liquids, they don't have a fixed shape, but they do have a fixed volume. So if you should pour some water in a glass, the water will take the shape of the glass, but the volume of the water will remain constant. The particles aren't fixed in a fixed place like the solids, Therefore, it has intermediate forces of attraction. And as I said before, I'll elaborate on this point a bit further. Gases, on the other hand, they expand to take the shape of their, con of their container as well as the volume. So they don't have a fixed shape and they don't have a fixed volume. And this is because they have relatively weak, well not relatively, really weak intermolecular forces of attraction. Now, let's look at the various states of matter a bit deeper. With solids, as I said before, solids have strong intermolecular forces of attraction and the particles are immobile. And you can see here that the, sol that the, solids, the solid particles are held together in a fixed, rigid system where the forces of attraction prevent the particles from moving. They can only vibrate in a fixed position. The liquids, on the other hand, has intermediate forces of attraction and the particles are free flowing. So essentially the particles are flowing over each other. When they come into contact with another liquid particle, there is a small attractive force and then as the particle continues to move, this attractive force breaks down. So the liquid particles constantly flow over each other, unlike the solid. In the gases, the gas particles are not pretty, are not very close to each other. They're far apart and they have little to no attractive forces for each other. So essentially, when they come into contact, they just bounce off from one another and they travel at high speeds. Now let's take a look at the different intermolecular forces of attraction. The first one that we look at is ionic bonding. And what is ionic bonding? Ionic bonding is an electrostatic interaction between a cation and an anion. It is formed when a metal atom donates its electron to a non-metal atom. And in so doing, it generates uh, two charged particles. So essentially, an example of an ionic bonded compound is sodium chloride. If we should look at sodium, sodium has one electron 
on the valence energy level. Now, in order to attain stability, it would want to lose that one electron because if it, does lose that, if it loses that one electron, it will attain a noble gas electronic configuration of neon. Chlorine, on the other hand, is a group seven element. And that means that it just needs one electron to attain stability, to form its octet. And it can get that one electron from sodium. So chlorine wants to gain an electron, sodium wants to lose an electron. So elements take part in bonding to attain stability. Sodium would lose the electron and attain stability, chlorine would gain it and gain stability. So what happens when sodium donates the electron to chlorine? Well, when sodium donates the electron, it is losing negative charge. So therefore, it is becoming more positive. When chlorine gains the electron, it is gaining negative charge. Thus, it gets negative. And we thus have a, a sodium cation and a chloride anion. So positively charged species are termed cations and the negatively charged species are termed anion. Now, these opposing charges have a strong electrostatic interaction between each other. And that is what is called the ionic bond. And it's very strong. And as I said with metals, sorry, not metals, solids, it holds the molecule in place. And you can see here, you can see here, this is what is called an ionic lattice. This is a very stable configuration and strong bonding, strong intermolecular forces of attraction like ionic bonding tends to generate solids in these lattice structures. So if you should look on table salt, you'd realize that the salt particles have this cube looking shape. And this is because the salt particles exist like this in an ionic lattice where you have sodium cations on the corners of the lattice structure. And in between each sodium atom, you have a chloride anion in this three dimensional structure. Now let's look at some characteristics of ionic compounds. As I mentioned before, these ionic compounds tend to exist in lat three-dimensional lattice structures, which, are, which is pretty rigid and pretty hard to break down. So generally, ionic compounds tend to have high melting and boiling points. If we should think of what melting point means, melting point, the, to melt something essentially means to separate the particles from each other. If we should look at an ionic compound, it exists in the ionic lattice, a very stable system, strong intermolecular forces of attraction. To melt that ionic compound, we would have to break down this lattice structure. We would have to break down this lattice structure. And that would be pretty hard to do. So the melting point of something like sodium chloride would be pretty high and would be 801 degrees Celsius. Now, ionic compounds are also very soluble in polar solvents such as water due to the presence of ions because it's an ionic compound so you would expect it to have ions, right? So these are soluble in polar solvents and I'll show you why. I'll use water as my example. So, in a polar solvent, what actually happens is that you have a cation and an anion. And water, H2O, has an oxygen which is negatively charged and two hydrogens which are positively charged. To dissolve sodium chloride, the positive portions of the water molecule, which are the hydrogens, would surround the negatively charged anion. No. The negatively charged parts of the water molecule, which are the oxygen, would thus su surround the positively charged cation and separate the two charges. So the cation is now separated by, from the anion by water, and this is how salt is dissolved by water.
Ionic compounds are also good conductors of electricity as they conduct when molten or dissolved. When they conduct when molten or dissolved. So in an ionic lattice, in an ionic lattice, the, the ions are immobile. They can't flow. And in order to conduct electricity, you need a flow of electrons or charged particles. So to allow the ionic compound to conduct electricity, you'd have to melt it or dissolve it in water. And as can be seen here, the ionic compounds can also improve the conductivity of solvents. In this, that in this setup, you can see um, a solvent, ethanol, with no um, ionic salt in there, and the bulb does not light up, Means, meaning that it's a poor conductor of electricity. But as we add some potassium chloride, the bulb lights up, it improves the conductivity of the solvent. Water is a good conductor, a relatively good conductor of electricity, but if you should add some salt to the water, it would improve the conductivity. Now let's take a look at covalent compounds. Now, covalent compounds are formed as a result of the sharing of electrons between two non-metal atoms. Now, an example of this would be oxygen. And you know that oxygen gas has the formula O2. Now let's take a closer look at oxygen, molecular oxygen. Now, as the symbol suggests, it's two oxygen atoms bonded together and each oxygen atom has six electrons on the valence orbital. What that means is that oxygen needs two electrons to attain stability. And remember, atoms and elements take part in bonding to attain stability. You won't just see an oxygen atom just floating around by itself. It would bond with something in an effort to attain stability. In this case, it's bonding with another oxy oxygen atom. So, this oxygen atom, the first oxygen atom, needs two electrons. This oxygen atom also needs two electrons, and it's not willing to donate two electrons to the other atom. So what happens is that they come to a compromise and they share those two electrons in what we call a covalent bond. Now, remember, a covalent bond is the sharing of two electrons. No, well, not necessarily two electrons. The sharing of electrons and it's between two non-metal atoms. And if we should look here, we see that we have two shared pairs of electrons and that constitutes a double bond, like as you can see down here. Now, the first bond in the double bond is what we call a sigma bond, and the second bond is a pi bond, and we'll elaborate on those two a bit more in the next slide. But it's also important to note that with covalently bonded compounds, there are no ions generated in solution. Thus, unlike the ionic compounds, Covalent compounds generally can't conduct electricity, and they usually tend to have low melting and boiling points. And I'll also touch on that a bit further in this session. Now, let's look at sigma bonds. Now, sigma bonds are formed from the head-on overlap of S or P orbitals, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So, sigma bonds can be formed from two s orbitals, it can be formed from a s and a p orbital, or two p orbitals. That's why it was important for us to go over orbital, the shape of orbitals in our last session. So you guys should know that s orbitals are spherical, p orbitals have a dumbbell shape, and we also look at d orbitals, which is um, essential. It's, it's shaped like two p orbitals intercrossing. But let's not focus on d orbitals, no. Let's look at the s and the p orbital. So when I mentioned that the sigma bond is formed from the head-on overlap 
it, this would be a head-on overlap. Two orbitals coming together to generate a new orbital or a new sigma bond. It's also important to note that the orbitals have to be in phase for there to be an interaction. Now, this, we represent the orbital as being in phase by the shading or the color. So these two green or blue areas can combine to generate a new sigma bond. This portion that was not in phase does not take part in the sigma bond. We also have two P, P orbitals combining to generate a sigma bond. So when the P orbitals combine like this, we have a sigma bond being generated. But how does one generate a pi bond? Now a pi bond is formed from the sideways overlap of p orbitals. And I'll show you what I mean by that in this slide. So if we should look over here, we would see that these are two p orbitals. But you can see that this is not in phase with this. The first one is not in phase with the second one. So you have no bonding taking place here. But once they are in phase, you have overlap. So this lobe overlaps with this lobe and you generate that. And this lobe overlaps with this lobe and you generate this. And this, everything here is what we call a pi bond. It's not a double bond. This represents a single bond. And these two overlap because they're in phase. So for there to be overlap, the, the orbitals have to be in phase. Now let's look at the characteristics of some covalent compounds. Now, as I mentioned before, covalent compounds, they don't have ions and they don't have a strong intermolecular force of attraction holding everything together. Thus, the melting and the boiling points are generally low for simple covalent molecules. However, there are covalent compounds that have very high melting and boiling points, such as graphite and diamond. But later on in the course, we will mention those compounds. Those compounds are giant molecular covalent compounds. But for now, we are looking at simple covalent compounds like carbon dioxide and oxygen and nitrogen gas. Now, our example here is oxygen gas and the, and the boiling point for oxygen gas is negative 183 degrees Celsius. That shows us that it is very easy to boil oxygen, liquid oxygen. It takes very little energy. And as a result, oxygen gas is a gas at room temperature. They also tend to be insoluble in polar solvents and soluble in non-polar solvents such as hexane and carbon tetrachloride. So let's look at this diagram. In this diagram, hexane, which is a covalent compound, is hexane, I should mention, is one of the main constituents of petrol and we know that petrol is immiscible with water. So if we should pour hexane on water, what would happen is that we would see the hexane floating on the water, similar, similarly to how cooking oil would float on water. Why it floats on water is because there are no ions present, so the water molecules cannot surround the covalent compound to dissolve it, as it would do with the ionic compound. So essentially, the two are immiscible, and hexane floats on the water molecules. I should also mention that they are poor conductors of heat and electricity. Um, this is because, again, they have no ions, so we can't have the flow of charged particles to generate electricity. Let's take a look at hydrogen bonding. So what is hydrogen bonding? Hydrogen bonding is an interaction between a hydrogen that is bonded to an electronegative element and 
another electronegative element. Now, if we should, let's use water as our example. Hydrogen, in this example, is bonded to an electronegative atom, which is water. It is also, it can, now this hydrogen can interact with another electronegative element, in this case, another water molecule, and this interaction is what is called a hydrogen bond. Now, it doesn't have to be um, between an oxygen and a hydrogen. This hydrogen can be, bond, can be interacting with a nitrogen. It can be interacting with a sulfur or a halogen, like chlorine, fluorine, bromine. Once it's an electronegative element, and we'll touch on that a bit more in this presentation. Now let's look at some compounds that um, exhibit hydrogen bonding, and these include water and DNA. Now, hydrogen bonding is the main force that allows the DNA helix to coil, to form these coils and fold into different structures. Now the different nucleotide bases in DNA, as you can see from this demonstration right here, you have thymine, adenine, guanine, and cytosine. These are the four nucleotide bases in DNA. And adenine and thymine bond together, and guanine and cytosine bond together. And this bond is as a result of hydrogen bonding, because if we should look at this oxygen, which is negatively charged, it is interacting with a hydrogen that is bonded to an electronegative element in the form of nitrogen. So this is a hydrogen bond. This is also a hydrogen bond because it's a hydrogen bonded to a nitrogen and the hydrogen is interacting with another nitrogen. So this essentially holds the DNA helix together and allows it to coil in its different structures. Now, hydrogen bonding affects the boiling point of water, and I'll mention this a bit further in the presentation. But if you should look at water, it's a very simple molecule, just three atoms. So one would expect that water would have a very low boiling point, like something like carbon dioxide. It also has three um, atoms. But water has a very high boiling point, and this is due to hydrogen bonding. So to touch on this a bit further, let's look at the boiling points of groups four, six, and seven hydrides. Now, as we descend a group, we would expect that the boiling points of the hydrides would increase generally. And this was what we saw from, this is for group four. From methane to lead tetrahydride, we saw a general or a gradual increase in the boiling points, right? So we are expecting that for every group, as we descend the group, the boiling points of the hydrides should increase. But what we saw was that for groups six and seven, there was a sharp decrease from oxygen to sulfur, and from fluorine to chlorine. So essentially, water had a very high boiling point, a very higher boiling point than hydrogen, dihydrogen sulfide, and hydrogen fluoride had a very high boiling point compared to hydrogen chloride. But why is this so? We were expecting that water would have a lower boiling point than dihydrogen sulfide, and hydrogen fluoride would have a lower boiling point than hydrogen chloride. But why was HF and H2 significantly higher? This is due to water-hydrogen bonding with itself. Thus, it has a very strong interaction, inter intermolecular interaction with itself. Thus, it is harder to separate the water molecules. Thus, it is harder to boil water versus dihydrogen sulfide. Sulfur is also electronegative, but not as electronegative as water. The same goes for HF and HCl. Fluorine is the most electronegative element. Thus, it can hydrogen bond with itself at a, better, at a greater extent than HCl. 
thus HF would have a higher boiling point. So, hydrogen bonding also has application, other applications. It is also the reason why ice is less dense and floats on water. So let's look at the structure of ice and how it's formed. So at room temperature, you have the water molecules flowing over each other. As we cool water, the molecules slow down. And when they come in contact with each other, they hydrogen bond and they stay together for longer periods because it's colder. As water freeze and freezes and becomes ice, the water molecules take these hexagonal, forms these hexagonal structures, these hexagonal hydrogen bonded structures, where you have oxygens being hydrogen bonded to hydrogens, other hydrogens being hydrogen bonded to oxygens, and it generates this open ring-like structure with these micro cavities. So essentially ice has these micro cavities, these air pockets in them, and as a result, ice is less dense and floats on water. In water, at room temperature, there, these ice pockets, these air pockets don't exist. Water just gradually flows over each other and there is no space. It's also the result of the cohesiveness of water. So water forms these droplets because it's hydrogen bonded to itself rather than being bonded to the surface. So if water is on the surface of a leaf, it would rather um, coordinate to itself than the surface of the leaf. Let's take a look at metallic bonding. Now, metallic bonding is an electrostatic interaction between positively charged metal cations and a sea of mobile electrons. Compounds that exhibit metallic bonding generally have very high melting and boiling points, such as tungsten. The symbol for tungsten is a W, and it has a boiling point of 3,422 degrees Celsius. They are also excellent conductors of heat and electricity. Heat because the particles are very close to each other and they can pass on the heat and electricity because there's a sea of mobile electrons that are circulating the metal cations and I'll show a diagram of that pretty soon. They, are all, they also tend to be insoluble in solvents because the metallic bond is basically too strong to be separated by the solvent molecules. Now let's take a look at the diagram. Metals are termed malleable and ductile. Malleable means that they can bend, they can stretch and bend because these spherical cations can essentially flow over each other, right? So you can build, bend the metal, um, bend the metal. They can also be drawn out into long tubes, also because the cations can float over each or slide over each other, and they can conduct electricity because of these mobile electrons that are orbiting these cations. It would be expected that a group two metal would be a better conductor of electricity than a group one metal, because a group one metal has one electron on the valence orbital, and the group two metal has two. So it donates more electrons, thus it would be a better conductor. So once you apply an electric field to the metal, you'd see the electrons move from a random orientation and flow towards the positive charge. Let's take a look at the final one, which is the van der Waal forces of attraction. Now, these are weak, Intermolecular forces of attraction exhibited by small, nonpolar, simple, and simple molecules. These molecules that exhibit van der Waal forces of attraction, they don't create a, a physical bond like covalent or ionic. It's just merely a very weak interaction and it's easily disturbed and it vanishes over longer distances. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Now, let's use helium as our example. Helium, it's not polar, it's just a, a very stable 
atom. Now, if helium should come into contact with another helium molecule, what would happen is that the electrons in this atom would repel the electrons in the other helium atom and push majority of the negative charges on the other side. Therefore, this side has a buildup of electron density and it becomes slightly negative, while this side has a slightly positive charge. Since this side now bears a positive charge, then the electrons in this atom would flow closer to the positive charge and we have a system like this. Now this is called an instantaneous dipole. It's not a permanent dipole like HCl where the H is positive and the chloride is negative. It's just an instantaneous induced dipole, a very weak interaction and if the molecule should be separated, it, it would vanish. Now, let's look at some questions. The first question says, which of the following pairs of elements would generate an ionic bond? The first one, A, we have potassium and lithium. We have, for B, we have lithium and copper. For C, we have potassium and fluorine. And D, we have chlorine and oxygen. Now, to an answer this question, we would have to know what an ionic bond is. And we did mention that an ionic bond is an interaction between a positively charged cation and a negatively charged anion. So it's in essentially an interaction between a metal and a non-metal. So we have to look and see which of the following has a metal and a non-metal. The first option is potassium and lithium. Those are both metals. So that's not the answer. B, we have lithium and copper, both met metals as well, sorry. We have potassium and fluorine for C. Potassium is a metal, fluorine is a non-metal, so this would generate an ionic bond. So the answer here is C. Let's look at another question. Question two says sodium chloride and potassium metal can both conduct electricity. Which of the following best describes how each conducts electricity? All right, let's analyze each question. A says both conduct electricity in the solid phase by the flow of ions. B says molten aqueous sodium chloride conducts electricity by the flow of ions, while potassium conducts by the flow of electrons. C says molten or aqueous potassium, molten or aqueous potassium conducts electricity by the flow of ions, while sodium chloride conducts by the flow of electrons. And D says both conducts electricity in the solid phase by the flow of electrons. Now, sodium chloride is an ionic salt. Potassium is a metal, and we just, look at metal, we just looked at metallic bonding where we have the cations surrounded by a sea of mobile electrons. So we know that potassium conducts electricity by the flow of electrons, and it can conduct in the solid phase. Sodium chloride, on the other hand, is bonded in an ionic lattice. The ions are immobile. Thus, in order for them to conduct electricity, we would have to melt the sodium chloride lattice and free up the ions, or we could dissolve it in solution to free up the ions for them to conduct. Therefore, the answer here would be B. Because B says molten or aqueous sodium chloride conducts electricity by the flow of ions while potassium conducts by the flow of electrons. So with ionic compounds, it's the ions that conduct electricity. While with metals, it's electrons that flow to conduct electricity. And it's important to note the difference. 
Let's take a look at question three. Question three says, which best describes the formation of a pi bond? The first one, we have head-on overlap of s orbitals, sideways overlap of p orbitals, head-on overlap of p orbitals, or sideways overlap of s orbitals. Now let's go to the board and draw each of these answers and see what we get. So the first one says head-on overlap of s orbitals. So we have two s orbitals and for it to do a head-on overlap, they would have to combine head-on like this to generate something like this, a sigma bond. That would give a sigma bond. So the second one says sideways overlap of p orbitals and this is the shape of a p orbital. And if they both have the same phase, these should overlap. Oh, yes. To generate something looking like this. So let me shade here. And this would be our pi bond. But let's draw the other ones to see what we would get. The sec section C says head-on overlap of p orbitals. If we did a head-on overlap of p orbitals, this is what we would get. So the, this would be the p orbital, and this would be a head-on interaction, while this is a sideways interaction. So if we did this, we would generate This is what we would generate, and that is a sigma bond. Well, this is the pi bond. So part B is the right answer. Option B is the right answer, sorry. Let's look at, quickly look at the last two questions. Question four says, which of the following compounds would exhibit hydrogen bonding? And we have potassium fluoride, hydrogen gas, methane, and methanol. The answer here would be methanol, and that's because we have a hydrogen that is bonded to, a, to an oxygen. And that hydrogen can interact with another methanol molecule, another oxygen of a methanol molecule to generate a hydrogen bond. So the answer here is D. Question five says, arrange the following in order of increasing melting and boiling points. And beryllium is a metal, so beryllium would have the highest melting and boiling points. Now, we've come to the end of your classes for today. We encourage you to send any question you may have to Television Jamaica's Facebook page at Television Jamaica or to Instagram at television underscore Jamaica or simply use the hashtag TVJ class time. For a repeat of all three sessions, tune in later today on JNN at 4 p.m. or you can subscribe to onespotmedia.com to catch up on all you've missed. Class time continues tomorrow with CSEC math, English literature, and Cape economics. I recommend that you review last week's notes so that you will be up to speed and prepared for those sessions. Until then, bear this in mind. A dream does not become a reality through a magic. It takes sweat, determination, and hard work. It's here. Interactive classes for all ages on the School Time channel on OneSpotMedia.com.
with a combination of live Zoom classes and recorded class time, schools not out lessons, and numerous educational content. We've created a comprehensive 24-hour channel dedicated exclusively to educating our nation's youth. Early childhood through to primary, secondary and tertiary, it's one stop on one spot for education, 24 hours. Brought to you by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information in association with Television Jamaica Limited.